Hi there, and uh, this is our Christmas special, um, which will be showing on the Britain's in History page. So Merry Christmas to you all. Um, but today we're, we're recording on the 19th, um, and we've just heard um, of the passing of Baron Blackett, which we're um, very sorry to hear about. So condolences to his family and to everyone who's followed his work. Um, absolutely, absolutely. And- really sad to hear. Yeah, absolutely. and it really just sort of uh, brings it home to me about why we do this. Yeah, which we yeah. Uh, we will we will um, endeavour to to carry on and, and keep on shouldering this work and and its movement forward. So thank you, Baron. Okay, so yeah, I've um I went to uh, London recently. Mm. Um, went to um, go and see uh, Rob Shaw's talk um, at Watkins Books, uh, which I've seen Rob talk before. He's a great talker. He did a great job of presenting um, some of the, the themes in his book, uh, which is here. You can you can buy this at Cumbria Glyphics, and I'll give a uh, a link to it in the, in the description below. It's fantastic. I've lent my I lent my copy to some bugger, and he still got it. Oh, you haven't got it back yet. <laughs> I want it back. I want to read it again. <laughs> yeah, yeah, absolutely. Recommend anyone um, reading it if he wants to see you know how London plays a big part in the how our history has been suppressed and some of the very interesting um, architectural elements of London post the the fire, um, the Great Fire of London, and how there was a great plan to uh, rejig the architecture in a, in a kind of very uh, precisely meant way. And, and I'll let Rob explain that in his book, um, and I'll give a link mm. to his page in, in there as well. <clears throat> Did you say that the... Um... The talk was recorded. Yes, I did. Yeah, it's not up yet. I think I haven't seen it go up. Well, we we applying a bit of pressure here, are we? Yeah, maybe we are. <laughs> it's um, inadvertent. Don't, don't sorry. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, yeah, I'd love to see that. But absolutely, um, yeah. For, for for those of us who uh, couldn't make the journey so far, I'd never even heard of this London place before, and you know. <laughs> Big deal in the east, I've heard. Yeah, I've been to Bath once. Bath. <laughs> yeah, yeah, I know. No, of course, I've been to London before. Yeah. I've been to Troino Vantum. Troino Van- or Carelud as well. Oh, Carelud, yeah, absolutely, yeah, great. Yeah, yeah which we'll uh, we'll go into. Um, yeah, great stuff. And uh, yeah, so basically, getting back on track. Um, whilst I was in London, it was a great opportunity. I had a day off work um, and I just took that chance to go around and see some of the key sites in London, um, which are been central to this, the, you know, understanding London in this, in this other way, in this, in this hidden way, this, uh, this British and Bardic way as well. Mm-hmm. Um, and there's a few things which uh, I'll highlight, which, which, we'll go into and discuss and pull those apart. But I also went to the British Museum as well, just to get, you know, so I've got got some footage of some British artefacts in there as well. Yeah, great. There isn't loads in the British Museum. <laughs> no, there um, but there is some, there is some stuff uh, mm. which, I'll, which I'll go into. All right, so let's kick it off. Yeah, New Troy, Care Lund, mm. Londinium and London in that order. This photo here, great stuff, the very... Very Welsh looking dragon here. That's in the Temple Bar, which is very near where these statues were. And we'll go into that. Okay. Ah, all right. Cool. So, yeah, um, you know, if you've been watching our channel, uh, the Britain's in History channel, 
um, you, you'll understand the kind of spirit in which we approach history, which is very much questioning what we're given uh, as the basis of our, or is the basic kind of history we're given in school and in museums, etc. London has got a, an ancient hist written history, which is contained within the Welsh Welsh traditions and the Bardic traditions, um, which predates Londinium, which is the Roman settlement. Um, we're seeing a lot of archaeological finds at the moment, which allow us to challenge the the, the current orthodoxy to do with um, Romans founding the city and being the first inhabitants there. Um, mm. This there's this archaeological dig going on at the moment, which allows us to take the the, his, the history of inhabited London way back to the 36th century BC, and there's lots mm. of Neolithic pottery there. I think there's sort of lots of different fragments there, and I'll, I'll get, there's a couple of photos, and there's not loads of photos available, but there is an abundance of these of these um, pottery of these pottery artifacts available. Um, and and this is Neolithic, is it? This is Neolithic, mm -hmm. and it's actually in the Square Mile as well. So, oh, right. so yeah. it's in London, <laughs> proper London, yeah, yeah. <laughs> it's in Londinium. Lond yeah, exactly that. Yeah. And it's so there's there's no there's no doubt that there's a there's human activity going on there for a, for a very early time, and that um that that immediately allows us to really reshift our what we think of how london was incepted as a place um <clears throat> i was having a quick look at um finds that have been coming out of the thames recently because um, you know this is this is something that happens all the time and it just it still hasn't stopped yielding artifacts and there doesn't seem to be a time period that's not represented yeah you know so, yeah. Sometimes you get like amazing, like bits of Mesolithic flint work or something like that. Wow, Neolithic stuff, and then obviously there's been really famous Iron Age finds as well. Yeah, um, exactly. Yeah, just <laughs> yeah, fantastic stuff. So brilliant. Um, and uh, this is this is something that that Rob Shaw spoke a little bit about. So I have to credit him with this idea, but. It, it, the idea that Romans um, incepted London wasn't ever something that the Romans themselves claimed. Mm. Um, in fact, the Roman historians actually remarked on how busy the, the place was as a commercial centre, um, which obviously during the um, the, the, Ro the Romano-British, oh, sorry, the Romano-British commerce, um, they, they very much took, took advantage of. So, yeah. Um, so Tacitus writes that London was a, a busy commercial centre, um, and and as well as uh, Cassius Dio, um, he writes that the the Romans at one point were chasing down some Britons, and they they were you know they were failing until they found a bridge mm. um, just across the Thames um, to uh, to get these Britons, um, yeah. and. <laughs> one they hadn't pre-built <laughs> yeah exactly that yeah. yeah this is this is early early stuff mm. um and i hear there has been um a bridge found there has been uh, evidence of, of an early bridge found i couldn't find it anywhere online but what i have found is um this big chunk of wood here which is it's said to be ad 75 according to carbon dating right um but that, yeah that's yeah okay so carbon, i carry on carry on what do you think of carbon dating peter well i uh, we could go two ways on this yeah. let's just even go i think carbon dating is fine let's just go with that and does that date when the when the wood went into the water does that date when the wood was cut does that date when the wood was first grown like what which part of the wood has been come is it the outer rings of the that's been carbonated which would give a more closer idea to when it was cut but if you took it from the center then it would be a it would be a younger date so yeah you know that that it's it's just like yeah you just it's just you can't 
it's really difficult when people just say, oh, this has been carbon dated. It's like you you really like to know the process of yeah how they did it and where they took it from and just hope all you can do is hope that they did it in the best possible way. But yeah, unless so unless you have it written in front of you, it's yeah, I just get find a bit. Yeah. yeah. It, and and that is exactly along is along the, the same lines that I that I think of this sort of thing. Um because what what you can say is that at in AD seventy five that's that's a year when you can sort of benchmark to say the Romans were doing certain things in Britain. I.e., I think they were building Fishbourne Palace at seven, in seventy five. Yeah. So they've got. But there was already a lot of Roman stuff going on there long before the Claudian invasion as yeah. well. If Fishbourne as well, like so. But yeah, carry on. Sorry. Yeah. Yeah. yeah no worries. Yeah. No, I was. Yeah. It's great. I. I just. I thought I'd bring this up because. Yeah. I, I can say you can say okay, AD seventy five. Okay, great. You don't know the methodology that goes behind that. No. Might, it might have been a hundred years before. It might have been a hundred years after. But it, they've got to choose a date to put down, which is commensurate with the narrative. Yeah, um, yeah. nice round number as well. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> five, <isn't it? laughs> exactly that. Exactly that. So, but what I'm saying is, we've got we've got textual content of wharves or bridges, yeah, which are pre-Roman. And we've got ancient evidence. We've got evidence of ancient wars which are emerging, uh, which could be pre-Roman. I saw somewhere that people that people say it's it's debated whether it was Roman or pre-Roman. So you you see this kind of thing a lot, which yeah. is, it could be Roman. Yeah, and it, it more more than likely leans over to that Roman side quite a lot. Yeah. Um, yeah. I know that's not the best. You know, piece of evidence, but it's, it's something to think about with this sort of yeah. thing. Yeah, I d I didn't even know this existed, so it's great to see anyway. Cool. So cool. that's cool. Nice one. Um, but going back to my the trip that I had, um, I went one of the the, the actual artifacts which I went to go and see was the London or Brutus Stone, as it's also been called. Is that one called the Brutus Stone too? Is it? Yeah, it was. It was in the nineteenth century. It had a um, there was a big noise about it being belonging to Brutus. Oh, fair, okay. By by interesting, Brutus. but yeah. it, it's but before that, I mean, I yeah, is, is, is here at the bottom here. Shakespeare had a, a scene where um, Henry the Seventh actually strikes this sword. Uh, oh, stone. oh, really? It's in Shakespeare, is it? So it's it's in Shakespeare. So it's a lot older, probably the nineteenth century. Yeah, absolutely. Um, that that kind of idea. So, and obviously, what you've got, what Shakespeare's done there, is linked Henry the Seventh in with that the brutes of England history, which is to do with, you know, it's got the Arthurian thing in there, the very yeah, Arthurian of course, yeah. motif of striking the sword against the stone. Yeah, uh, as, which is associated with sovereignty and connection between kingship and the land. Yeah. Um, going back to the, I I've, I've got a video of it. I'll show you in a second. But um, yeah, this this was in Cannon Street, which was close to where it was found. Um, I think it moved some from somewhere else beforehand. But it was in a really uh, not very nice housing for a long, long time. And this is its new right. picture, which I'll show you in in the video. Yeah. Okay. But the the official consensus on, on this. Bit similar to what I've just said with the with the wharf there, um, it's it's debated whether it's Roman or not. People it's say not, it's, it? I've never actually heard that before. <laughs> They're not saying it's Roman. Yeah. Oh no. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. I see. I'd heard it. It was um, like you know, either like a Bronze Age or late Neolithic. Yeah. I, I'd heard that go around, and I think that's really interesting because it shows how. That these these monuments continue to have relevance in different periods mm. for different reasons. I think that's absolutely fascinating, um, and possibly that that we have a very old tradition at that time, so we have a sort of a link back to that past. S striking that sword of the stone could have gone back thousands of years. Yeah, Just don't yeah. know how well those main histories are maintained, but that's a really old written, uh, you know, reference that 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 monument was still being used and had relevance in in that time period, which is really cool. 
Um, but yeah. yeah, I'd not heard it was Roma. <laughs> <laughs> but I'm yeah. not surprised, to be honest. No, no, we, you, this, we see it all the time, don't we? Are yeah. we going to tick the last box on the bingo card? Oh. Uh, Has anyone said it's Saxon? <laughs> no, they haven't. No, oh, or, right, Norman, okay. or Norman, no, they haven't. We've escaped that one. Yeah, yeah. How oh, funny. Um, <clears throat> but um, it, interesting you said that about the, the sword and the stone going way back. I actually came across this story um, this week about a, a Tuscan tradition of that. Oh, really? Yeah. Which I, oh. I, sorry, I didn't prepare for this to, to, to mention this. I was going to mention this later, but I'll throw it up on the screen for you all to see anyway. But there's a, an ancient uh, Tuscan story which does the same thing. Uh, with the um, sword, sword in the stone, and Tuscan, as we know, is um, mm. modern day Etruria, where the through the mi migrations uh, to to Britain, that's where the the Britons said they came from via uh, Troy via Etruria. Um, yeah. <clears throat> cool. Cool. Uh, that sounds great. Brilliant. So, so narratives which have been associated with this with this stone, as I, I mentioned earlier, William Shakespeare. Mm. Uh, but it was in the 19th century where this idea of it becoming, or this idea of it being belonging to Brutus was big, um, you know, or you know, it, it was that was when it was, you know, coalescing as a as a as a myth or as mm. a. But um, so Blake Blake mentions it as being a um, a druidic ritual ritual stone. Um and an Anglican priest, um, Richard Williams Morgan, um, also cites a, what he says is an ancient proverb, which states that so long as the stone of Brutus is safe, so long will London flourish. And I uh, thought that was worth mentioning. Yeah, yeah. Cool. So... But yeah, here's, here's a little video of the new fascia of the um, Brutus Stone, which I've got in the, my new GoPro camera. <laughs> yeah, the, nice. Cannon Street. Is, is the building a bank? Yeah. Awesome. Yeah. Yeah. Oh, wow. Look at that. So it's, a, it's a limestone. Am I right in saying the suggestion was. It, it got buried up to a certain point and then they just knock the top off and that's the top. And the rest is possibly buried. Oh, I didn't know. Uh, no. Yeah, literally just from the build-up of human midden, you know. Yes. Uh, yeah. it, it, it got, and, and like the building, you know, everything. everyone's building on cellars of old buildings and things like that and going up. The level goes up, apparently the level went up to a certain point and then it was causing like traffic accidents or something like that. Right. So they just knocked the bit off that was above the surface. And that's right. what remained. And that's what it, it is. But I don't know how, if that's an assumption or. Yeah. That'd be good to look into. That's, that's you see me well researched as always, Adam. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Um, I have read it, but I don't know where. Yeah. Right. yeah. Well, it, we it, I'll uh, I'll throw it up on on the screen if we get it. But um, yeah, the remaining part of the London Stone, which once stood in the middle of Cannon Street, slightly west of its present location, its original purpose is unknown. Although it may be Roman, it uh, and related to Roman buildings that lay to the south, it was already called the London Stone in the 12th century and became an important city landmark. And in 1450, Jack Cade leader of the rebellion rebellion against uh, the corrupt government of Henry VI struck his struck it with his sword to and claimed to be Lord of London. Lord of London. Yeah. Cool. Um which sounds similar to the um the Shakespeare motif as well. Yeah. Yeah. Um yeah nothing nothing mentioned there about it um being um broken off but I'll yeah I'll we'll dig into that. Yeah, it might have just been on the Wikipedia or something like that. Oh, it's londonstone.org.uk. Um, so, yeah, so did you... Is there any clue to what these Roman buildings to the south might be? No. Are they suggesting it was just a building block? Yeah. I don't know. Um, 
I couldn't see anything on that website. No. Oh, all right. Fair enough. London is it just is it just the same thing? Yeah, it seems like that. Yeah. Yeah, that's presented here. Yeah. 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 So it's it's um yeah. I mean, if you've got a settlement in a in, you know in a inhabited area, it's going to be amongst Roman buildings if it's pre-Roman. <laughs> yeah, absolutely. <laughs> you know what I mean. So. <laughs> It's not going to move out just for the Roman period, is it? No, no. Move back in after. Yeah, yeah, exactly that. <laughs> like the Brits yeah. are led to have done. Uh, yeah. Um. But yeah, no. Uh, th- this is this is actually the the thing I went to go and see first because I was I had to see it first. Um. And this, cheers, Peter, for uh, sending me. The, That's all right. Like, I it that. was something. It was something that Ross did ages ago, and it, it was one of the things that really stuck in my in my mind, like uh, as a place. And I, I'd love to, I'd love to see it myself. Yeah, I'm absolutely. glad you went and got some good video and some nice photos as well. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, it, it, this the, these weren't easy to find, um, and I'll I'll post up the address of where they where they are. Um, mm. I found them in a Orthodox church. Um, it's St Dunstan, so it's it's this this thing. I have to mention this quickly. Um, yeah. You know, in my site visits, I'm starting to see a lot of the relics of the British epos being preserved or kept by the Orthodox Church, um, like in like in Colchester, the cult of um, St Helen of the Cross. It's like the only reference you get in Colchester to St. Helena of the Cross is in um, the, the church, the, <laughs> the the Greek Orthodox church there. They're, and they've got a big cult for it there. Um, wow. Seems to be the only reference to it. it mm. was when, when when I visited Colchester, you know, uh, not even in the, the... So in Colchester Castle, there's a great museum there. They've got lots of sort of Roman stuff, you know. Usually, yeah, yeah usual kind of thing but no reference to saint helen of the cross or anything like that but the, in the greek orthodox church they they they're making a big show about it fascinating um well, and it, sorry. Do you know, why do you think this is adam um i think <laughs> this is because um where we've had the culture of um roman christianity in britain for such a long time you had I think a vested interest in keeping that British epos suppressed or did a great job to keep this sort of these sorts of narratives um outside of conversation. Um we've had a, a long we've had a long tradition of of that, you know, before we had the Reformation, before we had um, you know, the the, the move to Protestantism, we had a long period of history where British Christianity and any notions associated with it were seen as, uh, I guess, heretical or something not worth talking about. Or, you know, we, we've illustrated before on this channel how those narratives, because they're so closely associated with legitimation to rule in this country and also to claim a very orthodox and ancient Christian heritage, um, they have been a, a real threat to the Roman Catholic Church. Um yeah. That 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 is probably I think the key, isn't it? Is that the the philosophical and uh, religious element of it is absolutely fascinating. Yeah, but it it's unfortunately comes into a very sticky point in this country, where as you say, it's really closely related with how uh, with the rulers of our country, and yeah. so and then immediately becomes highly politicized issue and yes. you know what 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 seems unnecessary as religious dogma is actually because it's propaganda it's political propaganda yeah um, uh, and they're just so unfortunate you know just it's just a, it's just unfortunate really in, in this country it's so it's become such a contentious issue for yeah. the most powerful people on the islands for thousands of years yeah, absolutely. Um, yes, I, I mean, I'm, I'm thinking along the lines now that um, the period in which you had Edward I, who 
caught basically cornered, you know, the northwest of Wales into a war that they yeah. were being with Llewellyn and Griffith. Yeah. I think a lot of that was um, sim uh, simultaneous or contemporary to the um, the Holy Inquisitions in Europe with the Roman Catholic Church with um, the Cathars and the Waldensians. Yeah. Who, uh, um, essentially, the remaining kind of Gnostic Christians uh, in Europe. Yeah. Uh, so there is, I think, in the 13th century, a real uh, drive from the church to become quite aggressive towards... <clears throat> um, Nonconformists. Yeah, so, not, yeah, exactly that, exactly that. Uh, and everything, And uh, on that note, I think when we look at Gnostics now, I'm, what I'm quite um, dubious of is the way that information about Gnostics is presented now because they are presented through what we know about them. And what we know about them is written before the finding of um, the Dead Sea Scrolls and now come Yeah, on. yeah. Before that, the only information we had on them was written, but were written by the um, Catholic priests who had to write propaganda about them, who wrote certain things about their theology, which was um, maybe incorrect, maybe there to essentially ward you off becoming one. You know, um, that's another topic, though. Yeah, absolutely, not, fascinating. Not, not to Let's get back to Lud. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. So anyway, back to Lud. So his statue with his two sons, Androgius and Tenvantius, are situated in the, in the vestry porch of this church, which I'll, which I'll um, give the, uh, the, the the address to, so you can go and see it for yourself. Um, and Lud, according to Geoffrey of Monmouth, um, is the founding king of London. Um, and he, London is essentially his fortress. So Lud, um, the 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 uh, where we get the name Ludgate essentially has been attributed to King Lud, um, mm -hmm. and Lud <clears throat> Ludgate interestingly is the highest point in central London. Oh really? Yeah, um, which I found out yesterday. Um, <clears throat> but but ideal the, place for a little. Hill fort, then that's that's where I'm going with that, yeah, yeah, absolutely. I'm glad the I'm glad you said that, <laughs> yeah. Um, so awesome, I yeah. didn't know that. I, I, I didn't really didn't know that, you know, when you're doing this kind of stuff, and I we've spoken about this before many times, you get all these sort of kind of synchronicities where you're watching TV or you're reading a book or you're just listen to the radio, whatever it is, but you get information come at you, which is seemingly unconnected. But yeah, it's anyway, I was just watching um, a TV show yesterday and they're talking about how Ludgate was highest point. Oh, uh, nice. That was, that's great. <laughs> Excellent. <laughs> He's going to have a seat, you know, uh, of sovereignty anywhere. It's going to be at the highest point there, isn't it? Yeah. Um, and, it, you know, it fits the pattern of Roman town building. It makes sense that there'll be, there would be, a local fortress there. I mean, yeah. but that's why they placed them in places they were there. And the Thames didn't just like magically become a good trading river when the Romans turned up. It already was. <laughs> like it's, it is what it is. So, uh, yeah. you know, there would have been people. We know there are people in the area. These are, these are the sort of like the main players in, in, in the uh, Caesar's invasion. <laughs> And the early parts of the Claudian invasion, the Thames Valley is so important. Like, yes, yeah, we know the you know the low sorry the lower Thames Valley is you know there's people there like, and they're defending it <laughs> quite voraciously as well. Mm -hmm. So, um, and we know there's political strife amongst them as well, which is interesting. But, um, yeah, it, you know it means it's an important and contested region. Like it. it Say it can't, it doesn't just become valuable when the Romans turn up. Like, same goes for the seven, yeah, absolutely. Where you've got a river, you've often got, yeah, your settlement for numbers of reasons. Mm -hmm. Um, so another good thing to bear in mind. <clears throat> um, but the Lud, Lud is interesting for many reasons, and a part of that is his ancestry. Mm. And who he's linked to. Um, 
So Lud is remembered as the son of Belimaur. And the, the we've spoken about this particular F, uh, thing before about um, you kind of get the mythologization of certain historical characters and they yeah. have there's there's that reality there kind of metaphysical reality of uh, how they're remembered in myth yeah. um, which is sometimes well sometimes often conflated with real historical personages with, yeah real, with real histories um and belly Maul is is one of those one of those characters so is so is, is is his mother who's said to be in the um the british mythological epos um said to be anna of arimathea mm. um who can be a confabulation of of the british sovereignty goddess don sometimes lud is um the husband of don or the son of but it's in in Annals um, Cambria, um, which I'll, I'll give a link to. I've given a link to the Harley and MS three nine five eight. Lud is rather the husband of Anna Anna of Um But there's that there's that link there. I'll um, I think um, I think Alan Wilson, I think Alan Wilson and Baron Blackett give uh, give the same give the same idea there. And this is um, where Jesus is buried, which. Uh, when looking at belly mild is essential uh yeah uh, give a give a link to that as well <clears throat> um so well it is christmas so we should really mention jesus it's not all about father christmas is it <laughs> Santa exactly Santa, <laughs> father christmas father christmas the mushroom shaman as I thoroughly believe he is. Oh yeah, the Animanita muscaria. Yeah, absolutely. Right. Flying reindeer, you know. But yeah. also, I was thinking it's very much like a fey character, isn't it? Like knows if you're good or bad, and you know comes into your house, leaves things for you, but you've still got to leave more gifts out for him. You know, it's very much like mm. fey folk and pixies and things like that. Yeah, it's strange. It's got to be a. It's got to be. Mu I bet that's thousands and thousands of years old. You know. This idea, yeah, older than Coca Cola. <laughs> older than Coca. That, that, yeah, that's the thing. I mean, wasn't Father Christmas dressed in green before he was red because of the Coca Cola advert? Well, I heard. I I think it was like not any particular colours. So he yeah. you, you see him in brown or green or blue or whatever. But I imagine probably red and white as well. But I think Coca Cola definitely made it like super popularized it as red and white which is why we use it all the time which is quite funny like what is there some sort of <laughs> esoteric reason why they're into the red and white santa you know <laughs> well it could be because as mentioned the animanita muscaria are red and white yeah absolutely like, yeah so uh, when, people, when people say uh coca-cola were the ones who turned father christmas red and white you can go well hang on it could come from a psychedelic cult which uses <laughs> Red and white <laughs> mushrooms. <laughs> oh. Who knows? Who knows? <laughs> nice. Um, anyway, so yeah. Um... Back to Lud. Back to Lud. Back to Lud. Back to Lud. <laughs> yeah. So yeah, Lud is you know is the husband of uh, Anna of Arimathea. Um, yeah. Which is what is agreed by Wilson and Blackett. Um, who is also Don in the epos? Um, and you've got this, this uh, essentially this concept of a slist Don, which is what I've heard certain people say is the, the bardic name for London. Slist, mm, interesting. Yeah, slist Don means the court of Don, Ooh, yeah, court, court of sovereignty. Yeah, so that would make sense for it to be London. But there's another place that this list on could be as well, and I'll get back to that later on. Oh, cool. Um, um and that that uh, the word list has has come through in so many uh, British place names, um, and is sort of uh, probably more maintained in Wales in its in its spelling in that fashion. But I've seen it in a 
number of different ways that it's mutated. Um, yeah. So mutating list on into into London is not beyond the realms of possibility. No, no, absolutely. And especially if, if you've got this relationship between Lud and Don as well. Yeah. Yeah. Lud, Don, it's it's you know, it seems to seems to be some sort of um some resonance there with the with the names. Um but I just wanted to throw this in quickly about how um Don is attributed to the constellation of Cassiopeia. Um which is also to do with a, a bardic seat. Oh right, cool. That makes sense. You know, there's a there's yeah, a yeah. idea of it being uh, that there's like a, a throne enthronement thing going on, and and um, Don's daughter, um, who is also said to be the sister of Lud, um, gets the Corona Borealis as well. So the, the so the crown. Um, right, okay. And I, so all of these motifs surrounding Lud are all to do with sovereignty, okay, mm -hmm. which is, you know, it makes sense because Lud is in, incepted London. You know, and the, I'm, not, I'm not talking about the mythological epos here, mm. um, but actually I think these, these, these become superimposed onto real people for certain reasons. Absolutely. Um, talking about how that tradition has, has sort of kept that alive. So I found that found that really interesting. <clears throat> In as much as the, the uh historical Arthur of the sixth century, the Morgan and Gwent embodies some idea of the ancient uh mythological Arth, bear warrior, bear prince, you know. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And therefore these these ideas have become, you know, snowballed together. Yeah, but that, yeah, there's a there is a reason for it. There is a reason that he, you know, because he he was a a very powerful and uh, powerful leader and brilliant soldier. So yeah, we go. Yeah, exactly. Um. So there's another uh, reference to um, Ker Arianrod, which is uh, Arianrod is is Lud's Lud's sister. Um, and there's a um, a rock um, in Gwynedd, which is associated with that constellation as well. And Gwynedd is another one of these places where there is a court of sovereignty. Do you see what I mean? Yeah. Okay. Cool. Yeah. So I thought I'd just add just add that in there. And there's a link to the website where I got that as well. Um, right. So before I move on with Lud, um, and oh yeah, I'd love to see this Lud and Belly. Here's a here's a video um, took again of of. Uh, of them in the vestry porch and there's no as you can see there's no um label as to say who they are or anything like that so huh. fantastic yeah I, I i can't remember which wilson and blackett it is but uh might even say on the something about the wikipedia page maybe not but i believe these went up and down on Ludgate several times throughout history, or that uh, at least these were replacements for ones that have come down, and then these oh. ones have been up and down as well. So uh, I thought it was very funny in the wake of our, you know, we had some uh, recent iconoclasm with the with the slavery, uh, anti, you know, Black Lives Matter and stuff like that. The throwing statues away, and it's it, it just shows it's just interesting how when politics change, uh, you know, certain things get destroyed or moved or whatever. And I just think it's so interesting with these with these British histories how they have been up and down several times <laughs> as the wind changes, you know, or as or certain people want to use things for their own benefit, you know, they'll they'll take take that up again. You know, and yeah. put themselves as and cast themselves as part of it. Um, yeah, absolutely brilliant, fascinating, um, good yeah. old lad. <laughs> brilliant, yeah, that's it. And that, and now he's living in a in an Orthodox church, which yeah. seems to be the only people interested in upholding a kind of you know the, the, this old history. And something uh, something that's just come to me about that is that um, there, there's there seems to be uh, a 
kind of veiled respect for Britain's orthodoxy is what I kind of feel mm. you know, in these people that they recognise that there is um, an orthodox Christian um, label which can be attached to us here in Britain um, mm. due to our history. Um, yeah. Well, it just um, just shows which way the politics is at the moment that mm. Kaelud is in, you know, in the vestry porch of the yeah of a church. Yeah, exactly, exactly. Um, excellent. I, I one more thing about Christianity in Britain before we move on as well. And this is totally unrelated, but I don't know if you saw the um, uh, Catherine Bester uploaded a um, a section of a letter sent uh, by Elizabeth the first. Oh yes. Yeah. 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 That was incredible. And th yeah, this it's great. Yeah. I'll, I'll, I'll um, share that on the screen as well, but that this is a, another um, example of, of that kind of battle that's been going on in Britain for a long time between us and the church, um, which is that, you know, and th this is, this was a, this was a time, the Tudor period was a time where that British epos, where people like Lud were celebrated. Um, mm. These, I think these statues aren't far off, Elizabeth, to be honest. In terms no, of no, I think, that, I think you're right. Yeah. Um, Elizabeth is talking about how we've, we've been kind of led astray by the church in, in certain times. Uh, mm. And there's, there's a, or that we're being led by a, a what was it? A wolf or some kind of, Pray animal mm. instead of in instead of a careful shepherd, uh, and that she actually made a reference to the flock of Christ as well when when referencing the British people. Interesting. So, so I'll I'll, um, I'll I'll uh share share a page of that as well. But this it's this just thing... it's just one thing that annoys me is that it's even like what the politics is either way doesn't bother me personally. I just mm -hmm. like to know the history. Yeah, but the the his the history hasn't been discarded and sidelined because it's not you know because it's wrong yes <laughs> it's because of political reasons that it's been put to one side and then once you understand that you can then get so much more of a richer idea of our history when you when you embrace it and you and you look at the whole thing holistically you can see there's way more going on you know and it's so much more interesting and that's what it, that's the big deal for me i just want to know the history you know excellent excellent shove yeah. your politics you know <laughs> <laughs> yeah yeah absolutely yeah they shouldn't shouldn't censor us from certain information which can give us further context for our past and i think yeah so or just allow us just sort of allow discussion and in a way well, not say allow it. I mean, it just doesn't happen in the mainstream at all. And it would be lovely to see people actually talking about archaeology and history in terms of a, a Brythonic Britain as well as a, you know, an English Britain or a Welsh Britain or a, you know, Scottish Britain. You know, it doesn't really, yeah, make it, sense. It doesn't make sense. No, like, no, no. No, especially when we're talking about the time periods we're talking about as well. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Great, absolutely great point. Um, so that actually leads us on quite nicely to a discussion about Belly, um, because he's often presented as a um, as belonging solely to Gwynedd, which mm. is. But this is this is um, something which is held in the mythological epos, right? And actually, because so many Welsh kings claim descent from Belly, you, I'm sure you're going to see you know, instances where he's going to be confined to a certain area over another, basically. Yeah. But this yeah. this needs speaking about because unfortunately because because that's happened in the main the mainstream consensus suggests that we can't attribute Belly to being someone who is at real, who who actually lived. Um other scholars um argue differently. Um and I'll go into that. But the the link has been made also traditionally be, um, between Belly Maur and Kimbelin or Kunabeline. Yeah. Um. And I think what I, I read something earlier. Um. 
that says, don't be tempted to do this because Belly is said to be in Gwynedd and Cunabalanus is the <laughs> king of the Cata yeah. the Catavalunis, which are in southeast England. Yeah. And that then, therefore, Belly Mal cannot be the same as Cunabalanus because of that. Right? Rubbish. Actually, if, if, you, if you understand Cunabalanus as someone who has offspring and descendants who then some go on to rule other parts of Britain. Britain, then, yeah, absolutely. They're going to claim that character in the mythological yeah. sense for that area. Yeah. Which I think is what's happened. Yeah. I mean, uh, I've seen a number of very compelling arguments for who uh, Cunabalinus is. Yeah. Uh, who we can relate him to in the in the British records, and I'm I find it absolutely mind bending. I find it really hard to to follow, like to try and weigh certain arguments up against each other. But um, yeah, so I, I I'm quite happy to to go along with with Belly as Kimberline as. Right, as, as I am as much with other arguments as well, um, yeah. but it's it's such a fascinating period, um, and also isn't there um, uh, isn't Helly related to honey as well in terms of meaning, and the yeah. Honey Island is is one of the ancient names for Britain, yes, or the island of Helly, not necessarily even honey at all, but that's fascinating, isn't it? But you know, representing the person, so. Yeah, yeah, and um, that's that's yeah in itself. I've I've I came across that as well. I thought that was really mm. interesting. Um, and we'll see. We got Heli is the is the reference in in Luke uh, three twenty five for um the grandfather of Jesus. Yeah. So that's that's which is um again that's in there uh, in this book here, which goes into all of this stuff. Uh, mm. Highly recommend it. Yeah. This is where you get the link to the kings of the Tyrrhenian Sea as well, isn't it? The, the, yeah. The, the, yeah. Yeah, absolutely. And that crops up so many times. That phrase has cropped up, yeah. Yeah. Absolutely. Um, yeah, and, and Heli by Jeffrey is given as belly. Belly, yeah. Yeah. So cool. That's, that's our link. Um. And obviously, I've, I've, in the, um, the 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 kind of conversation of comparative mythology, going back to the mythological belly again, belly mm. that that belly mouth is um, is is equated with Apollo, who's a sun god, um, yeah. who essentially was celebrated by the Romans. The Romans were very into sun gods and sun worship, which I th I think is why that image of Jesus becomes superimposed onto the those images by the by the church at that point to celebrate a sun god basically and, and switch them over. Um origin yeah like I said Beltane yeah Beltane and yeah the origin of, of Beltane as well which yes and and as I've as 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 Peter's mentioned Belly Mauer is is seen as uh, Jesus, uh, the Jesus who came to Britain, um, or at least, um, or at least a, a son of Jesus, or a descendant of Jesus, or a relation of Jesus. Yeah, yeah. Uh, cool. What was there was another one I was going to add. Did um, Wilson and Blackett also? Uh, do they translate uh, Belly as like the tumult? Yes, yeah, the, the great, great tumult, and it's, it's, yeah. it's, it's, it's part of their point that where they're trying to point out the uh, the Romanization or Latinization of some of the British names to sort of kind of draw you away from what the actual meaning of the names is, because then it shows that they are actually a title and not a name uh, or an yeah. epithet or something like that, something similar. Makes sense. Um, yeah. well, that's the argument made anyway. I think it's, I think it's really interesting. And another thing is, uh, there's another belly as well, isn't there? Brother of brother of Bran, yeah, little Brennius, who, uh, and it's Belly and Bran who, and Geoffrey of Monmouth sacked Rome. Um, uh, it's something I've been 
think it just keeps on popping into my mind because uh, that brand is interesting because it's another one of those occurrences where I don't think that the, the Roman records and the, the and Jeffrey of Monmouth actually disagree with each other. Yeah. So uh, they say he's a king in Gaul. Jeffrey says he's a king in Britain and Gaul. Mm-hmm. Okay. <laughs> they both say they sacked, you know, he's not exclusively a Gallic king. But yeah, his brother who yeah. continued to rule in Britain after they had a falling out and Bran Brennius ruled in Gaul was, uh, was another belly and could very well have been on the same line and that's why this name crops up again and again this is something that happens, seems to happen a lot in 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 genealogies is well and kings do it all the time so kings and queens do it all the time taking on names of uh a name can be very powerful so mm, yeah yeah absolutely absolutely yeah we see that in the in the welsh genealogies quite a lot don't we yeah yeah absolutely yeah and the romans were fond of it too Yes, yeah, absolutely. absolutely. Mm. Cool. So, yeah, Historia Britannum mentions Belly uh, as a reference to Cuna Belinus. Nice. Right? Um, which is why I think Belly Mal, because he's presented as the the king of Lud. Uh, sorry, yeah. the, the, the father of the father of Lud. Um, that's why it fits in for me for being in the southeast of England, the Catalonia, yeah. on that Thames there, on the on the north side of the Thames there. Um, yeah, and as I've as I've mentioned earlier, that that element, um, because I, the yeah the, the the thing about Belly being confined to Gwynedd in the myth means that we can't attribute him to Cunobelinus. Mm. But for me, it seems that the, the, the timelines fit in, um, and they're, they're around. They're around the same time. They're around the same. Yeah. Time. So I, that that for me, I'm at, at, at the moment happy to say that the Kuna Belinus is uh, Belly Mal. Um, but um, yeah. So on my trip as well, I went to uh, see the Mithraeum. Nice, which is. Uh, it was round the corner from the stone, literally. <laughs> oh right, great. Well, yeah. Um, and um, there's there's a, a an interesting link with Christmas Day here for for Mithras, and the, the clue is around this border here, which uh, the twelve zodiacs. And uh, I'll go into that a little bit in a second. But yeah, Mithras in the center of the zodiacs. Mm. Uh, he's another solar god yeah solar deity used by it was very popular um with the romans until um 383 which is interesting oh that, yes that, that's the year that um magnus maximus invades brit uh sorry uh europe with yeah. the continent with his son andragathius and you might have seen, I think, possibly this creation of uh, lots of Mithraic uh, cults there, possibly, mm. and because that's and when it died out. That was when the last um, pope of Mithras, or the last papa of Mithras, um, resigned and said that was it. Anyway. I think there was um, uh, um, Magnus Maximus also persecuted some Christians he didn't like as well in Spain. Certain okay. writers, so he was obviously hot on a certain religious viewpoint uh, that was not either Mithraic or this right. type of Christianity. But uh, I believe it was was it Saint Samson or I don't know. It would have been much earlier than that, wouldn't it? Some other other famous saint who sort of uh, who has a British link who who. Uh, uh, spoke on behalf of them, I believe, to it. I'm not sure. I mean, sorry, that was a random thing I read ages ago that's sort of come <laughs> up again. <laughs> right. <That happens>, right. <laughs> uh. <laughs> cool. Right. Um so who is who is Mithras? Um Mithras is a is a Persian sun god, um, which goes back to 14th century BC. Very wow. old, very, very old um deity. Um 
the cult of Mithras in rhyme doesn't indicate a uh, a lineal kind of continuum of a Mithraic cult. Um, it's actually picked up and dropped over a long period of time. It was picked up by the by the Romans, obviously. <clears throat> um, but Mithras, Mithras's birthday, we know that Mithras. We don't know a lot, loads and loads about the Mithraic cult of Rome, but we know that um, Emperor Aurelian. Um, uh, confirmed myth, the Mithras Day to be on the 25th of December as a holiday for Sol Invictus. So this is all to do with the uh, the solstice and the return of the sun, essentially. Um, which is another, you know, like Apollo, there's this instantiation of Christ later on on all of these solar deities in Rome. And right. Do you see what I mean? Yeah. Um. Not not trying to offend anybody's religion here or anything like that. I'm just, it's you know, what yeah. what, I've, what I've found to be crossovers between, um, no, uh, you know, for example, Mithras uh, had twelve disciples, a bit like Christ, but they were in the zodiac. Do you see what I mean? Mm -hmm. So this kind Absolutely. of thing, this kind of thing is occurring where the Romans took certain motifs and elements from you know christianity in place among things which are already there so people could easily convert which is definitely what happened you know which is yeah. why we celebrate christmas on the 25th of december um instead of when you know he's said to have been born i think um wilson and blackett say it's on saint david's day or dewey's day now actually mm. dewey is dewey is christ and that's why we celebrate dewey's day on the uh first of march mm. um if you want to just can we go back a slide please Adam? Awesome. Yeah. So you got a, an interesting astronomical thing with Mithras as well, you know, relating back to uh, Martin's uh, star map. Um, you've got a position, I believe it's of Orion and Taurus in the sky. And it is yeah. it's the, 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 the slaying of the bull. Yes. And the, yeah. Yes. The, uh, the age of, the, the end of the age of Taurus as well. Yeah. Uh, very interesting. Yeah, I I think there could be an element with Baal as well. Baal is um the a, a deity, a Canaanite deity, which was essentially the diametric opposite of um of Yahweh. Mm. Um and uh people have people have speculated that that could be the the origin of Beltane as well, Baltane. Baal, yeah, uh, which is a, an interesting thing. But Baal is a bull as well, so that's mm. worth, worth mentioning. Worth throwing in there. Um, not going to claim to make any uh, kind of strong claims about that at the moment. An extra element I thought I'd throw in for. Apparently, the, uh, yeah. the so you know the uh, you know the big. Have you heard of the big Roman uh, temple to Jupiter at Baalbek in the Lebanon? This is a place um, where there's like three. The, the, right at the bottom of the temple, there's three enormous stones. They're like almost a thousand tons a piece. They're absolutely wow. ridiculous. Um, they're said to be part of the Roman building. People, others think they could be more ancient due to the size and stuff, and the Romans just built on top. But whatever. The interesting thing about Baalbek is that despite the the sort of Romanization of the temple, it's a great temple to Jupiter. Temple to Dionysius, uh, Dionysus, and uh, a temple to Venus as well. I believe there, wow. really amazing complex. Um, but the veneration of Baal continued really strongly throughout the Roman period, and apparently for a very long time after uh, at Baalbek, it was a, a very powerful uh, idea that 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 stayed there for a long time. So obviously, um, something very uh deep and strong there you know in that relationship mm, thanks for uh, that powerful ideas i think um yeah i think mm. there's a lot of uh should we say liberating behavior going on with the, <laughs> the worship of Baal? Uh, yeah, yeah 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 absolutely this piece is fantastic I was think. that so was that was that's in the myth uh Mithraeum, still that piece. Yeah, that. Yeah, that's um, 
that's in the the room you go downstairs and it's got yeah. um, some plinths and some stuff on it. It's really cool. Where there's this big one on Hadrian's Wall, we're really famous one. I'll throw a photo. Yeah, yeah. Uh, um, there was it was kind of it was a cult. It seems for the for the legions. Um, it's very kind of macho cult. Women could join. Yeah. Um, women women are there is evidence that women joined the joined the cult. Um, but it seemed to be a kind of boys club basically, and and a slave could join or a general could join. Uh, uh, but yeah, the, the, I mean the slave they think the slave didn't get very far. They couldn't have slaves in the same rank as uh, a general or you know something no, no, like no. that. But but yeah, this was something for for everyone. It seems. Um, and it, it had a lot of there's a lot of initi initiations and there were a few ranks as well. Um, and I'll, I'll, I'll see if I can find the the graph. A lot of similarities to to Christianity then. It is, yeah, yeah. So um, I was thinking as well. Like you know, I've often heard that Mithraism was sort of one of the big contenders of being the official religion of the of the Roman Empire. Yeah, it almost seems like they were like flipping through a book and like well let's have a bit of this and a bit of that and we'll take this from Egypt and we'll have this from Turkey we'll have this from yeah that's it yeah I I that as well there's a kind of a, a, a real battle between them to see you know which one's going to which one's going to come out on top and be the official one which is interesting why it ha ended in 383 for me yeah which absolutely is, yeah, and to think there was a Mithraic Pope as well, that's quite interesting. But it, I, I, an element which drew my eye immediately was this kind of Phrygian cap here. I don't know if you saw that. Yeah. <laughs> but that's cool. I, we, I think we mentioned it before, but I don't think... Um, I, I mean, I, I think they that is represented throughout the Empire. I don't think that's just a British thing. No. But, yeah, we've got another representation of... You know the the Romans are celebrating this culture with a an Margo from someone who's wearing a a cap, which is associated with that place we all associate with the migrations and where absolutely the yeah. Romans came from and the Britons subsequently came from. You know, so yeah, got to add that in. And is a, a sign of of liberty and freedom as well, as well as the way it's used. It's very interesting. It? Yeah, it's funny. It looks like a a liberty cap, isn't it? Yeah, well, they, so uh, slaves would, uh, freed slaves in the empire would don a Phrygian cap. Uh, so, yeah, it's 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 all interlinked. Oh, cool. Yeah. cool, cool. Yeah, it's very interesting. Excellent. Nice one. Uh, right. Um, and I just wanted to add this in, um, this is a, a depiction of... It's an early Mithraic depiction of a kind of Last Supper, almost. Not want to say that I'll cut that bit out, but you know, a kind of uh, a depiction of um, breaking bread with disciples, maybe something. Mm. Like yeah. <laughs> Sorry, I just saw the bird guy breaking seed with the bird guy. <laughs> oh yeah, <laughs> and there's a guy. They look, they look like um, uh, like like mummers, you know, like the um. There's a guy with like a horse head on the end. Yeah, entertainment or something, but uh, yeah, <laughs> brilliant. That is fantastic. Brilliant, brilliant. And um, got some photos of the uh, display inside. There's a real big um, light show that goes with it. You know, it's very, very well thought out in there. You get about five minutes in there before you have to get out. Oh, really? Yeah. But uh, here's the video I got. So you were uh, in a cellar at this point, is that right? Yeah, exactly. Would this have been an underground feature for them at the time? Certainly. Or was this... 
ground level? Do you know? It's a really good question. Um, yeah. Because certain cults certainly worshipped at the ground was pretty normal for some cults. So, yeah, uh, I wouldn't be surprised. But yeah, I mean, especially for a for a holiest of holy sort of room as well. Yeah, absolutely. The the um the cult of Mithras is based around obviously Mithras, who had immaculate an immaculate conception and was born out of the rock. So okay. You, you can imagine rituals going on and then being having to walk outside after that. That makes sense to me. Mm. It makes sense that it will be out uh, inside. But well, as a sun sun yeah. god as well, you would yeah. would just expect some light coming in somewhere. But yeah, that'd be interesting to see what what how Roman ground level relates to um, modern modern London ground level um, and where this site you know how this site would have been placed. It's amazing the walls there and everything that. It's, yeah. been, it's been nicely maintained. It has, yeah. Was there any fines on display at all? Or... Yeah, I will. I'll throw the picture up of of the picture I got of it. Right, but thank you. There's, there's an entire because I I took a video on the GoPro, um, but it it just it was rubbish, so I didn't put it in. <laughs> oh, <no. laughs> oh dear. Um, yeah, no, but there's a yeah, there's there's an entire cabinet of all sorts of things which have been found. Great, right. so it's, it's brilliant. There's all sorts there. It's really cool. Cool, brilliant. That's just another photo. Right. Cool. Right. And well, there we go. Yeah. I went to the British Museum, as I mentioned earlier. Uh, this is one of the artifacts which, when we're considering a pre-Roman inhabitants. Provides pretty good evidence for, I think. Yeah. Um, there's been a number of Iron Age finds made. Uh, this is one of them, the Battersea Shield, which is said to be a British uh, shield, um, found just just by the, the Battersea Bridge. Which is uh, it's phenomenal, it's, isn't it? Yeah. I don't see how it it just looks any different to what you would expect in the yeah. Mediterranean at the time. Yeah. Yeah, quite right. It's stunning. It's um, you know that, that what you're saying there. I mean that there's the scholars who make those distinctions to state that Celtic art, um, you know, and Etruscan and Scythian art all had this very common kind of aesthetic to it. Um. And it's yeah, it, they are all within kind of a bit like uh, the later kind of not work with the Celts and the Saxons. You think hey, is that Celt or is it British yeah. or is it Saxon? There's a lot of crossover. It's only them. there was some link between these areas, Adam. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> <laughs> exactly that. Oh God! And this right. this this is an, another artifact which is um, kind of. Presented in tandem with that shield, which is the horn helmet, you know, found nice. at Waterloo. And you think we know that the Britons used to put their put their artifacts in water. You know, I don't see that helmet travelling a million miles to you. It's, it's not battered, is it? No, no, no. Um. So I think these these artifacts as well they provide a further evidence for habitation, pre-Roman habitation in. In London. And of important people as well. Mm, exactly that. This isn't just, you know, Dave's shield, is it? No, exactly that. <laughs> you know, this is <laughs> it's not just Dave's shield. It's it's someone important's shield. It's King Dave's shield. <laughs> yeah, exactly that. Yeah. yeah. So yeah. that's fa oh, that's fantastic, that helmet. That is wonderful. It, I'd it, love it, to it. see that decoration a bit up close at some point. Yeah, I think I think you got a real kind of you know sort of these are examples of real ceremonial ritualistic kind of culture going on, haven't you? Um, here's another really interesting piece. Nothing to do with London, but it's in the museum. Oh, nice! And yeah, this is the Kirkburn sword, which is a British sword. Um, Beautiful kind of artwork on it. I don't know if you can oh, see it's it. That amazing. 
And this is this. this oh yeah, wonderful. Is, this has been brought back on back into um, display at the museum, um, and this is the mold cape. It's stunning. Yeah. Just. Well. Yeah. And this is even think this is even pre Albine. This is like tail end of the beaker people. If the dating's right, that is, you know, I, I don't know. Yeah. I don't even know how you come up with that that date. It must surely it must be from pottery found near it or something like yeah. that. Yeah. This piece is absolutely stunning. It's just amazing. Mm. It is, isn't it? It's... To think that was found here, you know, that that artwork and that kind of detail and the, the way it looks, it's it's like, where would you say that was from if you knew that wasn't found in Wales, Peter? Um, say Africa or the Middle East. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, that's what I had in mind as well. Yeah, like... North Africa, Middle East. Mm. Yeah. But do you think, you know, this is the... Phoenicians when came out of the Strait of Gibraltar and they went and depending on who you're talking to, some went south, some went a bit north, some went very north. You know, they were people hardly mention it. It's so odd how it's not as much in the public discourse as it used to be in in say in the nineteenth century. But Phoenicians in Britain seems like such a like a taboo thing. Unless yeah. you're in Cornwall, if you're in Cornwall, you can talk about trade, tin trade with the Phoenicians. You get cross over the border to Devon, you can't even met, bloody mention it, and no one ever, you know, they talk about the the uh, maybe up to the coast of Iberia or maybe maybe Western France uh, Phoenician settlements. They hardly ever talk about Britain as being covered in Phoenician settlements, mm -hmm. as it probably was, and but they also went south down to West Africa, you know. Yeah. Um, and possibly even over to over the Atlantic to America as well. Po wow. Possibly, I really wouldn't be surprised because they were bloody good sailors. Yeah. And the trade winds and the trade currents, as as Ross brilliantly showed once, and in the the Wilson and Blackett book on the Odyssey, where they did a little little PDF. The trade currents for the Atlantic and trade winds favor favor a transatlantic crossing west you know mm. and then you can just swing up the coast and come back across you know to britain so um Incredible. yeah i wouldn't be surprised if phoenicians were bringing ideas uh technology um art styles and and not just bringing them but taking them back with them you know that's the yeah. other that's the other idea and who knows what philosophy or other ideas came backwards and forwards uh Brilliant. And that is a relationship that's stayed with the west of Britain right through, you know, to the Middle East, right through to the early medieval period. Yeah. That Absolutely. that metal trade really drove incredible links between those parts of the world. Yes. For, for thousands of years. Like, it didn't stop. <laughs> it never stopped. Right. No, it never stopped. And there's, there's, there's plenty of corroborating evidence for that. Oh, um, yeah, loads of it. Loads of it. Yeah, it's it's just it's just incredible, and um, it's funny how that 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 idea of Phoenicians in Britain has been has been reduced to just just yeah, a, it's just it's it's just sort of like not really talked about. It's not, you know, you don't get thrown out if you talk about it, but it's just it's just not in the public discourse at all. Yeah, that's it. When yeah. you talk about those periods, it just doesn't come up anymore. Whereas if, if you look, read, you know, antiquarian. 19th century books they talk about it quite openly and yeah willingly and and the books are full of evidence you know yeah. uh both historical and and archaeological as well yes yeah there's that um stella in uh, israel isn't there or it, which is from you know tin from uh, cornwall or oh there. yeah yeah the ingots were found yeah absolutely in the, from, from yeah. the west country yeah absolutely and they they, they found more ingots off the coast of of Devon, which were obviously going somewhere, you know. So, uh, uh, yeah. yeah, great. Oh wow, yeah, these are great. Um, another example of very uh, 
skilled craftsmanship of a culture that use solid gold as well. Yeah. Uh, to uh to for their talks. Yeah. Which, uh, just beautiful. You know. Uh this is another show of how um British culture stayed uh between the Iron Iron Age and the late medieval period as well, because mm. there's evidence that talks will talks were worn as a sign of kingship in the Iron Age through the Roman period and still used them in the um in the early medieval period. That's fascinating. Yeah. I didn't know that bit. That's great. Fantastic. They are stunning. Look at them. Yeah. Yeah, they Just are. The array of designs. Some of the the fineness of the weave of the metal and some of them is Yeah, absolutely. That one at the back right is massive. <laughs> wow, yeah. <laughs> Proper that is a lot of gold. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Absolutely. Just beautiful. I mean, this is the image. Uh, these talks are incorporated into that 19th century savage image that you get, isn't it, with the... Um, oh, absolutely, the, yeah. The, 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 the woad picks and everything like that. And this is like... Yeah. It's almost as if to say, like, this is like, this is the evidence we've got of the ancient Britons. Therefore, that's all they wore. That's all. <laughs> yeah. That's and it's like, they had this incredible skill of metalworking, but they couldn't do anything. They couldn't make clothes. <laughs> you know? clothes yeah. Or armour. Yeah, weave weave right? metal, but not, not yeah. material. Yeah. Uh, yeah. <laughs> uh, but then, yeah, as I say, these, these things were definitely worn... Uh, during and after the Roman period, so you would also have to imagine uh, a Roman Briton in all his finery and his leather and his his weaved clothes and his boots, and also wearing the talk of a savage Briton. You know, so yeah. this is. But you can just look at them and say that is not that is the no. the work of a advanced culture. I mean, it's absolutely fantastic. Absolutely, yeah. So it's great, it's great we've got them to look at. Um, cool. And this, yeah, said to be an, an Anglo-Saxon sword, okay? That's but, our bingo card, Adam. Yeah, exactly. We, we knew we'd get there in the end. <laughs> yeah. Um, yeah, um, we've spoken enough about the, the alphabet on this channel. Yeah. Uh, this is a clear example of those Mediterranean alphabets or those alphabets which are linked with the Mediterranean and also Northern Europe as well, which seem to have a link. Um, said to be Saxon probably because of the runes. Yeah. Basically, in that the Britons didn't have the same kind of letters, which we've shown, we've shown they did. Yeah. Um, and I have no doubt there is some sort of ancestral link between Colburn and, and Firthark uh, yeah. I think uh, yeah it, it, they're too similar not to be aren't they it's like the DNA is the same yeah, yeah. absolutely but it's a really cool artifact really cool Um. yeah I think the the re the sorry the depiction of the British alphabet given by Nennius um would very much be happy with these with these letters which mm. I'll give an image for as well. But he he Nennius recorded the British script in the uh ninth century. Um yeah I'll uh, let you marry that up and, and see what you think. But yeah um We've got this stone as this stone cross. Mm. It's also said to be Saxon. They they say it's for, for a Cuthbert, pray for Cuthbert. But the actual name on there is Kin Kinny Balth. C Y N does not sound Saxon to me. It sounds very, very British. Yeah. And and it's found in Lancaster as well, which some... I just find it. I find it strange, to be honest. I find it strange in both Britain and with the Saxons about when you know when they chose to use what sort of alphabets. 
And especially, we can't just say that Latin goes hand in hand with Christianity, because there's obviously Christian monuments with different alphabets on, non-Latin alphabets on. Um, right point. Great. It's yeah. It's it's a it's it is an odd an odd period and an odd uh, uh, amazing mix of things going on, isn't it? Yeah, absolutely. That. Yeah. So where was this cross? Oh, Lancaster. Sorry, Lancaster. Lancaster yeah. So it's on that western part of the island. Yeah. Okay. <laughs> yeah. A ninth century, eighth eighth century. Eighth century. Yeah. Yeah. They say they can translate it to pray for Cuthbert, but mm. pray yeah. for Cunibar. Cunibar. Yeah. It sounds sounds British, doesn't it? It really does. Yeah, it doesn't sound like Cuthbert either. Uh, <laughs> no, <laughs> that that would be another example of that alphabet that the Britons were using as well yeah. in the western part of the of the island. Yeah. Cool. Um. So I'm moving away from the from the um, museum. There's not an awful lot of British stuff in there. So as I mentioned, I didn't want to go into too much about loads of stuff. I didn't spend too much time. They just wanted to see the British stuff. I've yeah, been there plenty of times. I highly, highly recommend going there, um, just for a, an absolute day trip of world culture. It's an absolutely brilliant place to go. Um, but these aren't places I visited on my trip. I I just wanted to add them in. Um, All right, cool, yeah. Just wanted to add them in for a bit of a effect because we were talking earlier about this bardic way to view London, um, which, which is a, a you know this system of remembering certain places and they're, they're, they're stories which are linked in with them, which help us understand this, you know, the certain areas, um, and the, the in the bardic tradition. The, the Tower of London is remembered as Bryn Gwyn, which is the, the White Hill, basically. Um, and a, a cool fact about about this place is that it's, this is meant to have been, this is said as, as where King Bran's head is buried. Yeah. You know, as you said before, Bran is remembered as a, a real historical personage um, who's also got their kind of mythological counterpart with them and there's yeah. Bran is kind of it, it Bran turns into the deity of crows basically. Yeah. And crows are remembered in the the kind of the well sheep as being um associated with bloodline and essentially raw bloodline. And if you look on the, the early Tudor crests they use three crows as their as their as interesting. Their yeah, and, and crows. I think the reason for this is is that crows, they their genetic memory and their memories of lineage are like a big. It, it's it's very apparent that they remember their lineage and their their ancestors. Oh right, okay, um, and, and, and and this is to do with them how they how they behave socially with each other, and yeah, absolutely, and and they've got. There's certain um, grudges as well. There's evidence that they have bloodline grudges. Mm. Okay, so that's really? a very interesting element to weave into this. Hey, um, um, Corvids are very intelligent animals as well, and right. are very, uh, you know, you can train them. Um, oh, right. Yeah. Uh, which is, is essentially, you know, you, you've mentioned the relationship between ravens and, and the Tower of London as well. Yes, it's sort of the relationship the beef eaters have with the ravens is because of how ravens are susceptible to to, to training. But all, yeah. all it's worth noting that when you go back to a certain point in history, people don't necessarily differentiate between corvids in the way we do. Yeah. So, uh, Bran might translate modern day into crow, but that doesn't mean that it doesn't mean chuffs, crows, ravens, um, jackdaws, yeah, or any other member of the Corvid family. Um, yeah, yeah, yeah. Because they didn't necessarily distinguish them in 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 older texts. Um, so, no, 
yeah, excellent. So I, I thought that that that's um, that bit of of folk memory there is is interesting. That's apparently why we keep them there in, in the in the tower. So yeah, excellent. Um, and also, it's said that um, Arthur apparently removed Bran's head from here when he became king. Yeah, uh, because it said that Bran's Brad uh, Bran's head had to be there to protect from invaders when Arthur took it upon himself to be like, no, I am now the symbol of that. Yeah. Dictatorship. So needs no other defense but him. Yeah. Yeah. yeah no. Well, yeah. Uh, <laughs> you can say that that, <laughs> that that didn't bode well, did it? In the no, end. No. But we um it's interesting you mention that because there's uh well going back to London and uh uh as a place of royal uh ba ba What's the word we're looking for? Authority. Yeah. Um. In the triads, London crops up a lot. Yeah. It does. You know, as a, as a very important place, as a seat of power, and as a place where, like, there's a suggestion. I'm sure. In, I can't remember what it was I was reading, but a suggestion that you know that you have to go to London. You know. Yeah. Even the Welsh kings would go to London to 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 assert themselves, and. It makes sense as a, a that that has always been a centre for that part of Britain, yeah. Just as much as um, somewhere like Kelly or might have been for Western Britain or Roxeter or York for Northern Britain or Edinburgh, so London would have been for that part of yeah. part of Britain for for God knows how long. Yeah, absolutely. Because uh, you said it, it, you said that they mentioned in the triads quite a lot. Yeah. Um, we understand the triads as kind of the writing down of these very old stories. And it's the yeah. same thing with the Mabinogi. You know, when I read the Mabinogi for the first time, um, London, again, there pops up all the time as this place which Peter's talking about, which is this, yeah, this place where you need to go and basically show your face. Mm. Um, and it, 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 in a way, it kind of, it's remained that place throughout time, hasn't it? It's like you get people who, you know, in the in the Industrial Revolution, London was this place paved with gold, where in which you know leave your farmstead or whatever it is and go and make your fortune in this wonderful place. Mm. So it's one of those things which is, and the um, the Italian bankers certainly thought it was an important place mm. to go to. The Italian bankers did, yeah, yeah. I mean, the, well, you know. The, that for, for, I don't think it was just being out of the reach of necessarily the church or anything like that. I think that's why why Britain has appealed to certain people and possibly even the Holy Family, you know, over centuries, being out of reach of the of Rome, whether that's in the guise of the the empire or as the church. But there's something else. Like why London as well? Why not? Yeah. Why not? You know, Bristol. Bristol was a huge place during the Industrial Revolution, but because yeah. uh, of the, the the seven. But really, we can talk about that as being part of the seven. But why London in particular? I mean, mm. why that place? Why that square mile where London? You know, Londinium is as well. Like, very yeah. interesting choice. I think you're 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 banging your hitting the nail on the head there. It, it, there is a mystery to that, isn't there? Yeah. I think you know if you believe in these sorts of metaphysical things if you will you know hopefully this video has been a good uh pulling apart of some of those mysterious kind of placements on this on this place by the the ancient culture that has been in this island for a long time hmm. um cool thanks peter oh thank um, you this is great yeah um cool and that the, the well, another thing to mention is this landing, which is Parliament Hill, which is, again, in the Bardic tradition, said to be a place where the Gorseth was held. Um, and that's why it's called the, the Landin. And that's why it's called Parliament Hill, basically. That's where it oh, gets its name. It's, got, it's a place, it was a meeting place for, for wise men, the Druids. Yeah. Uh, in ancient times, apparently. Uh, that 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 is that memory that that tradition is recorded, um, and um, a, a, a bit similar to Primrose Hill. Primrose Hill mm. uh, mentioned by William Blake, 
um, William Blake said that he saw the true spiritual son at Primrose Hill. Yeah. Uh, is, is that another... where YOLO is remembered? Yeah. yeah. Yeah, that's it. That's it. I'd love to see the YOLO monument at Primrose Hill. Yeah. It's yeah, quite a, a fantastic thing that's there, like this huge seal in the ground, like with mm. Cole Brunt written on it. And, yeah. I didn't like that. Yeah. I know there was something because there's something about Blake. Blake's got a part of it as well. Oh, really? He said that that um, little extract I just said is carved in there as well. Oh, interesting. And, um, nice. So yeah, it's, 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 people people have put a, spent a lot of money on that on, and a lot of time and a lot of thought on that Yolo monument. It's a uh, it's a real it's a beautiful thing by the looks of it. I've just seen images of it, but yeah, I'd love to see it. Fantastic. Yeah, I'd love to go and see that. Brilliant. Cool. Um, there we go. That's everything for London. Landon. Landon. Flandin. I like that. Flandin. Flandin, yeah. Flandin, exactly. Yeah. Uh, the enclosure that... of the town, of the city. Yeah. There's another, there's a place with Flandin in Wales as well. And it said there to translate as, um, yeah, a court, basically. Oh, so, ah, interesting. Yeah. So, yeah, all of these stories are woven into the to the fabric of the landscape, aren't they? So, and they're all there to to pull apart. Um, yeah. So, I hope hope you enjoyed that, folks. Well, um, I certainly did. I'm glad you did as well. Bugger the rest of you. <laughs> <laughs> and Merry Christmas. Merry Christmas. Merry Christmas. Oh, uh, this cross. I'd love to have a. I'd love to see this, Adam. Yeah. Yeah. This reminds me, can I just go on in a quick one before we finish? Yeah, yeah, of course. Um, I spoke to you about this. Um, I think we, we didn't do this on air. But um, a few weeks ago, or maybe a couple of months ago now, David Mosley shared on the on the BHH page um, some images of the Staffordshire Horde. Yes, yeah. Again, from this northwestern part of the country. Yeah. And it's said to be... Um, mid seventh century, so about six six fifty, I think they say they reckon it was buried. Um, by this time, this would have been Mercia. Yeah. Um. Uh, they say it's all Saxon. They say there's 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 a few pieces of earlier insular design. Uh, the word Brythonic or British is not mentioned anywhere in any descriptions I can find of the Staffordshire Horde. Mm. It's full of not work. It's full of Christian wow. symbolism. Wow. Um, which is very interesting because for, for mid seventh century, Mercia is famously still a pagan country. It's still a pagan state. You know, they, they, they one of the la one of the best organized, but one of the last last to convert uh Mercia was one of the last to convert to Christianity. So it's full of Christian symbolism in a time where they weren't Christian. Um, but they say that these things were then plundered off the neighbouring angles. Now, these angles would have only been Christian for 50 years. Yep, yep, yep. If that. And they seem to have a fully developed Christian design work in their artwork, which, you know, is possible. Um, but, yeah, there's not even one mention that it could have come from the other direction. You know, and come yeah, from yeah. come from Wales, from already very Christian Wales, or yes. even have originated from amongst the Christian and Brythonic people of Mer of of yeah. pre Saxon Mercia, yeah. who would yeah. have still been living in the area at the time. And I just I've been knocking my head over the images so much about where how they decide what style of artwork is Saxon and what style of artwork is Brythonic or British, yeah. and and they use this word like insular and insular includes Saxon style as well. Like technically, if you look at it, insular is meant to be a part of the development of Irish, British and Saxon artwork and particular, um, particularly through um, manuscript style. Yeah. You know, yeah. they see the artwork developing in the manuscripts, then it moves on to metalwork and, and stonework and things like that. But how they, Put down with a finger that like, that's Saxon, that's not Saxon. I I just can't tell myself. Like 
what, what motifs are you looking for? What does design styles are they looking for? And how long has it been skewed one way by the academia as well? Um, yeah. How many things are listed under in the museum as Saxon and a and a not Saxon? How much of the Staffordshire hoard ho is Saxon? Mercy, I just don't know. There's a, one one particular piece has a Bible verse written in Latin on it. Oh right, that's yeah, that's like devout Christians, you know. And, yeah, and, and also, uh, the, but that's the, been that's been that's been analysed by Okasha, and Okasha has done loads of Brythonic. This is someone who should really know the difference. And yeah, I've read the the thing, and it's saying, oh well, you know, this is very typical of Saxon lettering, and I'm looking at it thinking, yeah, but that's typical of Brythonic inscriptions that we've spent ages looking on it as well the letter styles uh using of dots to separate words as well things like that um wow yeah very mi good. mix yeah. mixture of of capitals and cursive styles as well all of it i'm just like that just looks so much like inscriptions that you and i have looked at which are unambiguously brythonic yeah how is this piece from pre-christian saxon mercia like what yeah they, they the the, Sac the saxons at that point didn't have a great grasp on latin either by the sounds of it either no no the, the um obviously the uh christianity being a new venture for a lot of saxons in that period as well so especially for the for for a metal worker as well we're not just yeah. talking about a you know a monk learning latin and, and writing it this for for it to then get to the level of metal worker as well is you know that that shows a development of artistic style, which takes time, yeah. time funding, uh, industry yeah. for it to be there, and support for it to be there. All of those things, which you're not going to get in fifty years, you might get in. You might, but, yeah. But it's but, it's all very tight, isn't it? And there's uh, yeah, but more reasonable explanations. It seems like the the Britons would have been doing that for a long time before that. Yeah, the the Britons were were known as the well were known as having very good Latin, probably the best in Europe. Mm. Interesting. Which yeah. is yeah, which is which is why the insular style was so successful. Yes. You know, and yeah. You know, and basically took over learning in in, in Western Europe at that period. Yeah. Um I think uh yeah. the, the the existing copy of Tacitus as they they believed was copied from a something written in Insula. Wow. Yeah, insular script. Well, right. But okay. yeah, so that's something to finish on. <laughs> on that bombshell. <laughs> I hope you've enjoyed this show, and I hope you have you've had a merry Christmas. Absolutely, we'll hopefully be back in the new year with a bang. Absolutely, with possibly Thornborough Henges Part Three. Yep. Hopefully, Thor Thornbra Henges Part Three will have maybe even Southwest, sorry, Southeast Wales zodiac revelations for you as well. Um, and hopefully, I'd like to get some some people on from um, Britain's hidden history to have a little chat with me and Adam. A few interviews would be really nice to uh, get the group together again. Um, and hopefully to meet up with some other content producers um, and see if we can do some stuff together and uh, and just sort of widen out the conversation further, I think, yeah. is our, our aim for the next year, isn't it, Adam? Yeah, yeah, absolutely. We we aim to do aim to do that, you know, cast the net out, essentially bring this as, to as many people as possible and open the conversation up to people who are interested in tracing topics and as well as bringing the conversation as much as we can back to these guys. Yeah. Wilson and Blackett, who, you know, today is very... Um, it, poignant. It, it, poignant. It reminds, it reminds us that we need, yeah, we, we need to honour their, honor their lives and honour their work. Um, Absolutely. The rise of those guys and of Ross, um, and and hopefully just bring bring home this message as, as best we can for for their contributions in memory of those guys, and also for you know ancestors and uh, everybody who's involved, who's got a kind of link to these these histories, which are going to be familiar for a lot of people. 
Um, mm -hmm. So, absolutely, and 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 our and our, you know, the the place that's around us, you know. Uh, yeah. Um, Martin kindly offered. He said, "Is this is there something I can help you and Adam with the videos?" And my initial thought was, the most important thing you can do is what you're doing already. Mm -hmm. going out to where you are where you live and having a look around and seeing what's around you because the history is right there it's not just in wales or just in cornwall or you know it's it's all throughout as adam has brilliantly shown in this it's even in even in the heart like even in london you know yeah uh, it, it's still there so uh, and that's the important thing you can do is 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 go out and and, and have a look for it because it is there um um, and in the spirit of Ross as well, hopefully do it in the best of um, spirits and um, with an open mind and uh, an open heart as well, which yeah. is very Christmassy <laughs> of me. <laughs> Excellent. I bet I've got to go and watch It's a Wonderful Life and drink some <laughs> old wine now. I feel so bloody Christmassy. <laughs> Excellent. That's a good idea. Mold wine. Mold, 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 but alcohol. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Right. Merry Christmas, everyone. Merry Christmas, all. <laughs>